What's up everyone? Welcome back to one of my favorite series on this channel, the Vitalik Blog Club, where we dive into the writings of the man, the myth, the legend, Vitalik Buterin. Vitalik's most recent post came in the wake of the Terra Luna crash and the de-pegging of UST. It gives us some tools that we can use to evaluate the stablecoins of the future. After the de-pegging of US Terra, it's still hard to know if there will be any algorithmic stablecoins that challenge the reserve-backed stablecoins like USDC. But one thing that I think Do Kwan and those in the Terra ecosystem were right about was that stablecoins are going to be a huge industry in the future. While a lot of crypto supporters would argue that things like Bitcoin or Ethereum are better than the US dollar as a medium of exchange. The fact is that almost everything in our daily lives is still priced in US dollars or whatever your local currency is for now, which means that using US dollars in DeFi as a medium of exchange still makes for an easier user experience for people that are just getting started with crypto. It's actually amazing how many critics of crypto I've talked to that actually aren't even aware that stablecoins exist. So a lot of their arguments revolve around crypto being too volatile, which obviously stablecoin solves. If you add up the market caps of all of the top stablecoins, including the centralized stablecoins like Tether and USDC, you'll get a market cap of around $150 billion. This is an infinitesimally small fraction of the US dollars in existence today. And I would really expect that we would see this number rise over 1 trillion in the next few years. But anyways, let's get into the blog post and see how we might be able to evaluate some of the new stablecoins that will inevitably rise up in the future. So Vitalik starts out by giving some context to the reason why he wrote this blog post in the first place, which is the crash of US Terra, Luna's stablecoin. But actually, he's not writing this in response to the crash necessarily, but instead in response to the criticism of stablecoins that followed the crash of UST. About this criticism, he says that the greater level of scrutiny on DeFi mechanisms, especially those that try very hard to optimize for capital efficiency, is highly welcome. A lot of the hot new decentralized stablecoins try and innovate by making them more capital efficient. But that comes with trade-offs and may end up resulting in the coin being unstable, which is why Vitalik is saying that criticism of those mechanisms is welcome. But Vitalik is saying that people are misguided when they're dismissing this entire category of crypto stablecoins. When he says automated pure crypto stablecoins, he's really excluding stablecoins that are reserve-backed like USDC and USDT. He goes on to say that there are a lot of stablecoins that are doomed to collapse eventually, as obviously UST was. That there are, on the other hand, many stablecoins that are highly robust in theory and have survived extreme tests of market conditions in practice, aka there are some legit ones out there. But one thing that people haven't really talked about are objective standards for judging whether the stablecoin will fall into this category, doomed to collapse, or this category, highly robust. While looking back in time and seeing how a stablecoin might have performed during really tough market conditions is one way to judge the viability of a stablecoin. We need a tool to evaluate new stablecoins to see how they will do in theory and predict whether or not they will be able to survive tough market conditions in the future. So he goes on to define an automated stablecoin as a system that issues a stablecoin, which is supposed to be tied to one US dollar or some other target, and has a decentralized targeting mechanism that doesn't rely on custodians, aka, like I said before, not USDT and USDC. So Terra is probably the most famous stablecoin that falls into this category. And Terra works by having a pair of two coins where the volatility is passed on to one of the coins in the system, which was Luna. If the value of the stablecoin goes above the target, new coins are created and sold, and somehow that value raised is used to reduce the supply of the volatile token. Vitalik then goes on to introduce another stablecoin into this slot experiment, and that is Rai. Rai is a stablecoin that's backed purely by Ethereum as collateral. The mechanism that it uses to keep its price is a little bit more complicated than US Terra, but at its core, there are two participants. Rai holders and Rai lenders. Rai holders are anyone that is holding the stablecoin on chain and using them in applications. Rai lenders, on the other hand, are the ones who are able to mint these stablecoins and introduce them to the system. They do this by depositing Ether into a smart contract, which then gives them the ability to mint a fraction of that value of Ether as the Rai stablecoin. More specifically, that fraction is two thirds of the value of that ETH. If the value of the Ether drops below that fraction, there's a liquidation. So the main mechanism that Rai has in order to control the price of its stablecoin is the redemption rate. 
If ride goes above the target value, incentives are increased so that more lenders will mint more ride. If it goes below the target, the opposite happens. So ride is actually new to me and I just realized something that's not actually pegged to the US dollar. Instead, it has a floating price point, which means that it's meant to be more stable than a volatile asset like Ethereum, but it doesn't actually limit itself to staying at one US dollar, which makes sense because the redemption rate is a soft economic mechanism. And it would be very hard to use this to force something to be stable at a specific price. So as you can see in this chart that Vitalik made, the target price is actually changing. So the main benefit that Rai provides is by actually reducing the volatility of something like Ethereum. If you look at the price of Rai over the last three years, you'll see that's hovered somewhere between $2.90 and $3.10. And this, this is a less than 10% swing in the price. And if you consider that the dollar has inflated at a rate of 8%, it really does seem quite usable as a stable coin. So back to the post and let's get into the actual thought experiments that we can use to judge Rai and compare it to Terra and then use to judge any new stable coins that might be coming into the world. So the first question when evaluating a new stable coin is asking if the stable coin can wind down safely to zero users. So thinking about UST and Luna, could they wind down to zero users? Well, theoretically, because the value of Luna is driven by the demand for US Terra, a very small number of Terra users would mean that the market cap of Luna would be tiny. What if there were something like 20 Terra users and the market cap of Luna was just $200? At this point, the system is extremely vulnerable to huge shocks, and we really can't expect this stability to stay. The other thing about Terra, which I've talked about in some of my previous videos, is that this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. At any point, if it looks that Terra is unable to maintain its peg, people will rush for the exits, which is exactly what happened in the Terra depegging scenario. So because of these two things, Terra could never actually wind down to zero users. Now let's take a look at Rai. Because Rai security depends on Ether, but the value of Ether does not depend on the usage of Rai, therefore that positive feedback loop that existed in the Terra ecosystem is eliminated. If for some reason everybody stopped using Ethereum for anything but the Rai token, then it would be back in the same boat as Terra and Luna. But because Ethereum isn't really correlated to the usage of Rai, Rai token can wind down much more safely. And you might not believe me, but I was actually thinking about that before even reading this paragraph where Vitalik says the same thing. That in that situation where Rai is the primary application for Ethereum, it's basically back in the same boat as Terra Luna. So the next thought experiment that you can use to evaluate a stable coin is much less obvious. What happens when you try to peg the stable coin to an index that goes up 20% per year? So Vitalik introduces a new index to map the stable coin to, which is a quantity of US dollars that grows by 20% per year. This thought experiment is basically saying that because we can peg a stable coin to whatever we want to, why not peg it to guaranteed returns on the US dollar? And because this and because of course this is impossible, let's just think about what would happen if we tried with these algorithmic systems. So Vitalik suggests that there's basically two ways for a system like this to play out. Basically, there's some kind of negative interest rate that's charging on its holders. So maybe while the price of these tokens will go up, the actual number that you're holding in your wallet will go down. The second is that this turns into a Ponzi where everyone gets really good returns and then it all goes to zero. And then Vitalik says that Rai falls into this first category with its negative interest rate and Luna falls into the second category. Therefore, Rai is better than Luna in this part of the thought experiment. Vitalik then suggests that somehow for a collateralized automated stablecoin to be sustainable, you have to contain the possibility of implementing a negative interest rate. So there are main two ways to have this negative interest rate. The first is having the balances decrease over time, which is possible using smart contracts. And the second is Rai style, which actually drops the price of Rai when the redemption rate is negative. So what can we learn from these thought experiments and this whole big Terra Luna crash? Mainly that the protocols should not be evaluated as they're growing or with the assumptions that they will be growing in the future. Instead, we should evaluate these systems as if they weren't growing or as if they were actually declining by a lot. Because Terra saw almost constant growth all the way up until its collapse, we never had a true test to see how it would fare if demand evaporated. So when you're evaluating that next big stablecoin, think about what would happen if the demand for it was not growing, and think about what would happen if the demand crashed one day. And I'll add my own two cents, where if you want any crypto protocol 
To be super boring, it's stablecoins. Terra Luna's hyper growth strategy and Do Kwan's clapbacks on Twitter were very exciting, but a stablecoin's goal should not be to grow, it's to be safe and boring and cautious. So good luck out there, do your own research, and hit subscribe if you want to be part of the next Vitalik blog club. Maybe one day we'll even get Vitalik on the channel to go over one of his posts.